Hello, everyone. My name is Keith Sprower, Chief Investment Officer here at Global Wealth Advisors, and this is the second quarter of 2024 outlook. With the first quarter being behind us, we can see that with all the concerns coming into this year and the markets misanticipating recession in 2023 and projected Federal Reserve rate movement so far in 2024, performance was pretty good, particularly in the equity markets. Large cap did very well, led by some of the growth names, uh, AKA the Magnificent Seven, which is Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Amazon, NVIDIA, Meta, and Tesla, with large cap up over 10%. International and small cap were up over 5% for the quarter. Where we saw muted returns is in the fixed income area. I believe a lot of this has to do with where we started the year. If you recall, we saw the 10-year treasury go from a 5% in mid-October of 2023 to a 385 at the end of December. This is a very quick drop in rates for that short of a period of time, allowing for great fixed income performance in the fourth quarter of last year, but we started out the year with low rates. So it's not too much of a surprise that we may give some of that back early this year, as well as coming to more of a realization that the Fed isn't gonna be cutting rates aggressively, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. One of my tenants is that global data is normalizing. And as you can see from these graphs focusing on the US, we are really back to pre-pandemic levels. These are showing a four year period on many of the most important economic indicators, things like unemployment, PCE, credit spreads, and earnings yields. What this tells us is that any anomalous influence from the pandemic is gone and we're moving into a period of a normalized economy, which I would define as an economy being driven by supply and demand, fundamentals and equities, and economic indicators, not so much on outsized or outside influence. With the exception of a few places like China, this is happening globally as well, and it's a good place to be as we move forward. As we've seen for the past few years, the Federal Reserve is front and center as a market mover. At the March meeting, they reiterated that they would expect to cut three times this year for a total of three quarters of a percent. They don't seem to be in a rush because the economic data is still coming out strong, which we'll take a look at in a moment. My thought is that they don't need to cut rates at all this year, but will likely do something later in the year. It's becoming awkward for overnight rates to be higher than long rates. I don't think a rate cut or two will spur inflation, but it may bring down borrowing costs a bit. Currently, we're seeing that the market is pricing in three cuts and the Fed is saying three cuts, and we haven't seen those two outlooks the same in a while. But as we know, that changes daily. It is important to note that the last rate hike was July of 23, so there's been an eight month pause. I do wanna take a minute to look at the internal box here on this graph. These are projections from the Fed and their meeting in March. This shows that some of the more important data to them for the end of the year shown and beyond. And what jumps out to me is that there is very little projected change year to year. And that is really not a big difference for the 2024 year end projections from where we are currently. Currently unemployment's at 3.8. Headline PCE, which is the personal consumption expenditures is at 2.45. And core PCE is currently at 2.8. One of the pieces of data away from the inflation numbers that is causing the Fed concern is the employment situation, AKA the labor market. It remains strong. Consensus had monthly job growth in March to be up 200,000. It came in at up over 300,000. And the unemployment rate itself went a little bit lower. The market and the Fed are looking for job growth monthly to be below 200,000. The unemployment rate to be at around 4% and wage growth under 4%, which it's not. They're looking for these to be more comfortable that the economy is softening a bit. These are not recessionary numbers. 
On their own, they don't give the Fed a real reason to cut rates and actually quite the opposite. Now, as we've discussed in the past, these are rough numbers subject to monthly revision, so we'll see what happens. As we look at GDP as an indicator of a country's growth, we have very strong growth compared to what has been expected over the past few quarters and have moved closer to the 2% long-term trend. And what we've learned from this trend is that although 2% isn't runaway growth by any stretch, it's above stall speed for the economy. If you recall the early expectation for the second half of 2023, as far as GDP is concerned, was very, very muted growth, which is exactly the opposite of what we've got. One of the reasons for the strength in the economy has to do with wealth and in turn consumer spending. These are fascinating graphs that show household net worth in trillions of dollars. The graph on the left is from 1960, the graph on the right is from the 90s, and they both run through the end of 2023. And we're close to all time highs at 156 plus trillion in wealth. This is certainly part of the reason why spending continues. The right shows wealth since, again, the 90s by generation. Not surprisingly, the baby boomers have a big portion of the wealth. And even though they've retired, they have still been spending. And again, this is a big part of why we're seeing spending trends continue. This brings up the question of what may cause all of this to derail. And the obvious answer is a recession. Two of the big conversations currently out there are around how quickly the Fed has increased rates to pull down inflation and where our energy price is going. Prior Fed episodes, when they're hiking quickly, have often been followed by a recession. The Fed has hiked rates over 500 basis points in a relatively short period of time, yet the economy has remained resilient. That leaves an energy shock. And at the time of this taping, the conflict between Israel and Iran has heated up substantially. I don't get the sense that oil at $100 a barrel will be too impactful, given we've been above 90 already. But oil consistently at 125 or 150 a barrel could be a problem. What does all this mean for the markets? For global equities, it's meant good things over the last 15 months. One of the stumbling blocks that has caused volatility is this back and forth on the data, the Fed, and the markets. Sometimes they've been very far apart, and as they are forced to get in line with each other, markets have adjusted for that. We've seen this very recently with employment and CPI numbers, where the data comes out slightly stronger than expected, and it causes a large down day in equities. It's this right-sizing to reality that is causing some of the volatility. A lot of the impact of what we have seen has also been on the larger growth stocks. And these two graphs show their impact on the overall equity market by looking at the price to earnings ratios or the PE. And as you can see from the left graph that the top 10 stocks out of the S&P 500 have a much higher P.E. ratio than the remaining 490 stocks. One of the reasons investors look at P.E.s is to get a sense of stock valuation, and there is a growing concern that these few stocks that make up a large percentage of the market capitalization of the S&P 500 are overvalued. The graph on the right shows the returns for these top stocks over the past few years. As you can see from the top green line showing the performance of the Magnificent Seven, that they have had some tremendous ups, but also tremendous downs, up 40% in 2021, down 40% in 2022. There are a few takeaways here. One is that technology continues to be important, and these companies and others will have their say in market direction. Secondly, it continues to be key to have a diversified uh, large cap portfolio. Having value stocks helps to temper these market swings and produces needed cash flow when markets are at their worst.
as we saw with the performance in Q1, interest rates have drifted higher since the end of the year, but continue to be range bound. The good news is that it's likely we'll stay in this range, which is 3% to 5% on the 10 year treasury for a while, allowing new assets to be invested at reasonable yields and current assets to be reinvested at better yields than we've seen for many years. When you look at the highs and lows of this graph, I can't think of a scenario where we would retest those highs or go back to those lows either without a substantial economic or financial system crisis. This chart shows how the S&P 500 has done during US presidential election years over the past 70 plus years. And what jumps out are the green and the red lines, where the green line is how the market does when an incumbent is running, as we've seen this year, and the red line is when it's a quote unquote open field or all new candidates. And you can see as we get closer to election day, the market picks up, which is likely because the uncertainty is gone or going away. The outcome this time may be different. Uh, there are quite a few popular third party candidates Robert Kennedy Jr., Cornell West, Jill Stein, and so on, if they can get on the ballots in enough states could alter what we're going to see on election day. Uh, to wrap up, the headwinds and tailwinds are subtly changing as we would expect them to. On the headwind side, we're still dealing with higher rates than we've seen in a while, but as I've said in the past, consumers will acclimate to the reality of the situation recall the household net worth chart. Conflicts are continuing to escalate and the probabilities are increasing that other countries will feel the need to get involved. This is rarely a good sign. We spoke a little bit about the markets and the election. And again, we may not have a clearer picture until very close to election day. There's a great deal of cash and cash equivalents, things like CDs and treasuries being held. I don't believe this is all earmarked to come back into the market anytime soon. Investors are very comfortable with where rates are on cash and will likely move some into longer dated fixed income when the time comes and not put it all into equities. I would guess that shorter term rates would need to drop by about 2% before there are significant moves out of cash and into the equity markets. On the tailwind side of things, you know, what's helping move things along or keep things moving in the right direction? We're seeing global central banks moving past the tightening phase of the cycle. Corporations are in great shape, balance sheets look good, and a lot of money is being spent on R&D which has shown to be a positive impact on forward earnings. And they are continuing to upgrade with technology, which will increase productivity. In short, I feel the economy is doing very well, away from some issues with China and a few other countries dumping goods into the global market to boost their exports. We seem to at least globally be moving in the right direction. As we saw, we are certainly in better shape than we have been over the past few years. And I think we're in a pretty good spot historically. This should give us positive six to 12 month outlooks for both fixed income and the equity markets. From everyone here at Global Wealth Advisors, thanks for watching and I'll speak with you next quarter.